out for that. Uh, I'm not going to say good morning to you guys, and I'm not going to greet you, uh, because the Word of God says in Proverbs 27, 14, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. <laughs> so I'm not saying good morning, and I'm not greeting you, okay? Uh, my name is Pastor Nathan. I'm one of the youth pastors here at the Bay Church. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. I don't know if you guys are like me at all, but I've been, this year, I've been really trying to go to the gym, and I've been telling myself that my new normal is to set my alarm for 5.30 in the morning to get up and to go to the gym. And I've made all these decisions. I want to be disciplined. I want to have better habits, better routines. Uh, that was my alarm going off just there, actually. Uh, but um, I, I, I decided what I wanted to do, but then my alarm actually goes off at 5.30 in the morning. And like many of you in the room, it's kind of one of those like trying to hit the snooze button uh, and then it goes off 15 minutes later and then I hit the snooze button again and then it goes off 15 minutes later and I hit the snooze button again and then at 7.45 I'm actually awake and it's too late to go to the gym. Uh, I also realize that I've been doing the same thing with God. Like I tell God I want to grow. I tell God I want wisdom. I want spiritual discipline. But then when he actually prompts my heart or speaks to me, where I read something from scripture that actually challenges me, I find myself hitting the snooze button on God. Thank goodness I'm the only one in the room that does that. <laughs> and the reason is because I'm a fool. That's why I do it. I'm not naive. I'm not innocent. I know that my time with God will make me better. I know that when he speaks to me, I will grow if I listen, but I still choose not to. Why? Because I'm a fool. And I think oftentimes we look at fools as the other people, the people that don't agree with me for whatever reason. See, as a youth pastor, I see this all the time. Nobody knows less when you're 15 than the two people named mom and dad. Uh, <laughs> And maybe when you're in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, nobody knows less than the 12-year-old doing a dance on TikTok. Like, the, the people who are the fools are the other people. I think as we're hitting 2024, we're going to hear a whole lot of people calling a whole lot of other people fools because it's an election year. Every, everywhere you turn in is going to be somebody calling somebody else a fool. But if we're honest, if we actually reflect on our own lives, on our own motivations, oftentimes we're the fools. There's actually a test for this, all right? Scientific test. I want you guys, everybody in the room, we're gonna do this test, all right? So I want you to take your right hand and try to match up your pointer finger right on top of your thumb. Now try to do the exact same thing on your left hand. And if you do it just right, you can bring it together and there'll be a little square right in between. Uh, now pull that really close, keep it together and try to pull it all the way to the bridge of your nose. Now with your hands there, turn to the person next to you and say, <laughs> You look like a fool. Uh, now that we have scientifically established that all of us in the room are fools, uh, let's embrace some of what scripture has to say to us this morning. Uh, there's sometimes when I read the Bible, uh, it's kind of mean to me. <laughs> Hurts a little bit, stings a little bit. But here's a verse from Proverbs 27, 22. It says this, though you grind a fool in a mortar, Grinding them like grain with a pestle, you will not remove their folly from them. What it's saying is that our foolishness is not just a part of us we can cut off. It's in us. It is deep down. I could grind all of what I have into a pestle and I still can't grind it out of me. It's stuck inside of me. And this is the pattern of our world. But the beauty of scripture is this. In Romans, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Scripture wants us to renew our mind, and it says that it's actually possible. I can renew my mind. I don't have to just accept the status quo of being a fool. And so I want us to hear today that the only thing worse than being a fool is staying a fool. The only thing worse than being a fool is staying a fool. Because if we're honest, we've all been fools at some point. But the only thing worse than being a fool is knowing you're a fool and doing nothing about it. When we read scripture, we read opportunities to learn. 
And so let's check out Proverbs 12.1. It says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Some of y'all were taught that you can't say that word out loud, but the Bible says it. So it's quoting scripture, okay? I'm just quoting scripture. Uh, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. I have a couple toddlers uh, and they're bad at everything. Other than being cute, they're terrible at everything. Have you ever seen a two-year-old run? Is there anybody who's gonna look at me honestly and say two-year-olds are good at running? No, they're terrible. They're terrible at running. They can't ride a lawnmower. They can't drive a car. They can't do complicated math questions. Two-year-olds are bad at everything. My three-year-old, she's like this much better and she wants to cook. She thinks she can cook, but she can't cook. Every single morning, it's dad, let's make pancakes. And I'm like, okay, let's make pancakes. So we start making the pancakes and then she's trying to pour the batter, it gets everywhere. Then I try to clean up the batter and then she's eating the chocolate chips. It's awful. But the worst part about it is, she won't just admit that she doesn't know what she's doing. And when I try to correct her, it becomes a fight. And then we spill more pancake batter because I'm trying to pull it away from her. She's trying to pull it away from me. And toddlers, they just are so unwilling to learn. And then I realize I'm the toddler. <laughs> I'm the toddler. How often do I read scripture and I'm just so unwilling to actually do what it says. I had this moment a couple months ago where I was like, you know those weeping moments like in prayer and worship where you're like, God, I'll do anything. I'll give you everything. You know, I was having one of those moments. And uh, like the, oh God, I'll give you everything. Like ask me anything big. And if I know it's you, God, I will do it. If I know it's you, God, I will do it. And I'm feeling like so spiritually proud of myself. And he's like, I have like a couple thousand pages of words that you know are from me and you don't do it. I was like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, whoever hates correction is stupid. Hmm. Well, uh, I think that's all of us at some points though, right? We, we see the stuff we should do and we don't do it. It's so easy to deceive ourselves. It's so easy to see the problem in somebody else's life or in their thinking or in the things that they're doing, but we don't see those problems in ourselves. And scripture sometimes wants us to be a little bit more reflective and to be more willing to learn. My encouragement to you uh, in kind of in line with a lot of what Proverbs says is find people in your life who are wise. Find people who will give you good advice, who are not so desperately clinging to be your friend that they won't actually say the thing to you that you need to hear, right? This is something that's so important for us. Parents, this is why God put you in the life of your kids. Don't be so so stuck on wanting to be their friend that you don't actually be their parent. They need you. Kids, it's gonna be tough sometimes, but mom and dad actually do know better in a few areas. Come on. Uh, and scripture can also be this place where we realize just how much we don't know where we realize just how much we don't know. It's important to love, desire, and seek out the correction of wise people in our life because they wanna help us and scripture wants to help us too. Let's check out another verse. Proverbs 18.2, it says this, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Has anybody ever met somebody like that? Uh, if you're not putting your hand up, you might be that person. <laughs> Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Have you ever heard people share unsolicited opinions? I think that's like the official slogan of Thanksgiving dinner is <laughs> unsolicited opinions. I think that's why they got rid of church barbecues and church potlucks because it was like two hours of unrefrigerated macaroni salad and unsolicited <laughs> political opinions. Uh, like. There's always like Uncle Jimmy coming over like, hey, so, and if there is a real Uncle Jimmy, this is, I'm talking about fake Uncle Jimmy, okay? If, <laughs> Uncle Philbert, there we go. I think that's not a name. That's a nut. Uncle Philbert. All right. Uncle Philbert's always coming up telling you about like the economy and 
you know he's not an economist, but he's always telling you about like inflation. And you know, the reason why everything costs this much is because they just keep printing more dollars. And you know, it would just, it would be worth more if you didn't keep printing all this money. And I'm like, Uncle Philbert, I don't think you have the training, but I guess it makes sense. Like if you want your money to be worth something, stop printing more money. If you want your money to be worth something, stop printing more money. If you want your words to be worth something, stop talking. (laughs) If you want your words to be worth something, use fewer. Use fewer of them. And the reason I share this specific proverb is because out of all the proverbs in the Bible, this is the one I struggle with the most, by far. My mom, she's amazing. She would always tell me, Nathan, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I said, yeah, it was his sign. I need to talk twice as much to keep up. Um, If you want your words to be worth something, stop talking. Find people who actually know more than you do. We don't know everything about everything. There's four different kinds of knowledge. There are the things that we know we know. For instance, two plus two equals four. I know that I know that two plus two equals four. Then there's the stuff that I know I don't know. So I know for a fact, I don't know any math beyond two plus two equals four, okay? (laughs) Then there's the stuff that you don't know you know. So I'm gonna resurface some fifth grade memories for everybody in the room, okay? Finish the sentence. The mitochondria are? There we go. You didn't know you knew that, but it just came up, right? There's stuff that we know we know, the stuff we know we don't know, the stuff we don't know we know. And finally, there's the stuff that we don't know we don't know. And I can't give you an example of that because I don't know what exists. The stuff that you don't know you don't know is your blind spot. And the problem with the fool is that he assumes that because he can't see it, it isn't there. We all have blind spots. And as we grow up, we become more and more aware of just how big our blind spots are. There's so much that I don't even know I don't know. And if I don't have people in my life who are willing to point out my blind spots to me, I don't even have a chance. But this is what scripture helps us to do. It helps us to properly place things into these categories, to be just a tiny bit more humble and less confident about the things that we think we know we know, because we might run into somebody that actually knows more than we do in those areas. But it also helps us to realize just how much stuff we don't know. If you haven't yet, read through the book of Job or the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Proverbs, the book of Psalms. These are are, are books of wisdom that are not just meant to be checked off a list once a year, but are meant to be meditated on because they're a, a meditation on the wisdom of God. It helps us to realize just how much we don't know. The other thing I notice about that verse, let's go back to that for just one moment. Fools find no pleasure in understanding. See, the reason they talk isn't to understand. It's because all they want to do is share their own opinion. But they're not trying to actually understand. And if I'm honest with you guys, it's actually a sin to not care about what our mind learns. Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. Part of my worship to God is loving him with my mind. I cannot accept a life in which I just don't learn anything. That's, that's sinful. I'm refusing to worship God with my mind if I don't cultivate it. If I don't expose myself to places that will help me to learn and grow, I'm refusing one aspect of my worship and love for God. If this is a space in which you're interested in growing a little bit, I wanna suggest a couple of resources, uh, a couple of podcasts, actually. One of them is called The Deeper Bible Bod- Podcast. Uh, that's run by Pastor Ryan Gregg, one of our teaching pastors here at the church, uh, and my wife, Destiny Kennedy, um, both excellent theologians and academics, but they have an amazing team around them that help them to share from the word of God. There's another podcast I'll also recommend, one that I don't share because they say everything right, but because they will force you to think. You will come away from this podcast either convinced that you have learned something new and shifting your view or your opinion, or better understanding your own opinion so that you can understand and learn about what you already know. That's called the Theology in the Raw podcast. Check those out. It's a great way to learn more. 
I think it's important though, as we think about how do I not be a fool and how do I become wise, to ask ourselves what is the foundation for that? What is the foundation for that? How do I even measure wisdom and foolishness? And Proverbs 1, 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, we could spend this entire series talking about little practical life hack nuggets about how to make your life better. But if all that the book of Proverbs was, was just a divinely inspired self-help book, it would crush us because I can't live up to that. So often in church, we hear things like just do what the Bible says or be like Jesus, which sounds really great. And I should try to obey, but also I'm not Jesus. I can't live like Jesus. I can't do it because I can't be wise on my own. I can't find knowledge on my own. I have to tune in to the wisdom of scripture. I have to. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I can't live good enough to earn God's approval. That'll never happen. But when God changes my life, changes my hearts, changes my desires, then and only then do I have the capacity to actually start to live out the kind of stuff he talks about. And if it's true that I should have the fear of the Lord, let's put up that verse, the fear of the Lord. Because fear, it's not talking about like, oh no, kind of fear, but like, oh wow. Okay, it's not, oh no, but like, oh wow. When I have that moment before God where I realize my awe for him, my respect for him, my devotion to him, those are the moments that I actually begin to see clearly. It's in light of seeing all that God is and all that he wants for me that my life actually starts to come into clearer focus. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to misprioritize your life? Why is it only after the fallout of the affair that you realize how much your family meant to you? Why is it only after that loved one has passed away that you realize how much they meant to you? Why is it that only after the devastating injury do you realize what a gift your physical health was? It's so easy to misprioritize our life because sometimes the things of God feel like they're on the other side of where I'm living now. It feels so distant. It feels more often than not, like I can just live my life in my lane, let God be over there in his bubble and I'll reckon with him at some point. But, but God is real and he loves us. And scripture says that Jesus is coming back someday to institute his kingdom. And if, if I die before then, I'm gonna meet Jesus. And what am I gonna say? And what's he gonna say to me? If that's true, if that is the case, let's think about another verse from Proverbs 27. It says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. There's a true story of something that happened back in 2018 in the state of Hawaii. Uh, everybody on the island got this text. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Imagine you're kicking back on the beach, drinking your virgin pina coladas, and you're just you know, hanging out. All of a sudden you get this text on your phone and you look down, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? There's videos of it because this was a real thing that happened. People were like running through the streets, seeking shelter, running to the hotels. And I heard a story of this family that was there. Uh, mom was nowhere to be found, but dad and the kids are running into the hotel. There's hundreds of people streaming in, just desperately looking for shelter. And they're just like desperate. They're crying, they're weeping, they're screaming, they're yelling. They're trying to get their affairs in order. They're trying to cash in on their life insurance policy. And they're also like praying 
Like, God, do something. Intervene. Send help. God, we don't know how to handle this on our own. There's a threat coming we can't take out on our own. God, we need something. They don't even know what God they're praying to, but they're praying because they realize in that moment, hey, I can't solve this. Maybe God can. I'm just going to throw myself on his mercy. And for 35 minutes, revival is breaking out in the state of Hawaii until finally they get an update text. Oops. Somebody hit the wrong button. And at that point, they don't even know what to do with these emotions. They're just emotionally shot. The kids and dad go upstairs to the hotel room and mom was just in the shower the whole time. And the kids are still freaking out. They're running up to her, mommy, mommy. She goes, what, what's going on? And they explain it to her and they ask where she was. And she says, oh, I was downstairs in the fitness center and a friend and I were just on the treadmill. We were talking, having a good time. We came upstairs, I went in the shower and now, now I'm here. I think that in, in the moments where life seems like it's just about to end, the veil between us and God is like this thin. Like the veil between what is and what actually matters is this thin. And we can spend our life choosing to look for those thin spots between right here, right now and the presence of God in our life or we can waste our life on a treadmill. I don't wanna just plod along, ignoring the fact that God is real. He loves us, but there's an end coming either to my life or to the regular workings of our world when Jesus comes back. I can, I can just keep ignoring that, living however I wanna live, doing whatever I wanna do, acting a fool in whatever way I see best. Or I can say, Jesus, I need your wisdom. See, fools, they see the coming danger and they just stay on the treadmill. They keep about their daily work. They keep their head down and they miss out on what God wants to actually do in their life.